Welcome to the Great Scott Podcast. Today's guest, Kat Kramer. Hello, everybody, and welcome back once again to the Great Scott Podcast. Today, I am joined by legendary, uh, the, the daughter of legendary uh, producer, director, and writer, Stanley Kramer. I'm pleased to welcome Kat Kramer. How's it going, Kat? Oh, I'm great. How are you? I'm Thanks doing, so much for having me. I'm doing great. Um, I hear that uh, where you're at is going to be locked down here this week. Yeah, we pretty much been, well, I've been quarantined like since the lockdown. I've, I've hardly yeah. done anything in terms, because um, there's no events, I, there's no gatherings allowed and um, they kind of loosen the restrictions and then it gets bad again. And then they, the governor and the mayor, you know, issue these huge restrictions. So a lot of people are upset about it, but, you know, Thanksgiving was, everybody did it on Zoom or yeah. on the phone. And I, I think that, um it's just really, really scary out there. So the best thing to do is just stay indoors unless you absolutely have to go out. And you know? do podcasts. Yeah. Yes, yes. I've been doing everything <laughs> on Zoom or podcasts or webinars. Yeah. And I managed to do a lot um, and work on projects. And I spoke to a, a group um, of women on a podcast um, a few weeks ago and then a Zoom meeting. And I didn't even perform a monologue on Zoom. So you can... Uh, you can utilize the, you know, the Zoom experience for uh, a lot of projects and a lot of interviews. Absolutely. And I think it's great that you've taken your podcast on Zoom. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I just recently started doing that since that's what everyone else seems to be doing. So, yeah. yeah. So I guess I, I'm new to this game, still kind of learning, but we're, we're, we're getting there. But uh, so, Kat, uh, first off, before I ask you, I want to ask you, um, there's a lot of books where you're at. I'm guessing that's, that's your office. Have you read each one of those yeah. books? No, <laughs> no, I haven't. There's actually a whole Shakespeare uh, library back there. Um, I've read a lot of those, but um, no, I'm trying to read. I have my own library tucked away somewhere else. Oh, gotcha. And but this is kind of my, uh, the main Zoom room, as you call it, that oh, I've been yeah. in all the Zooms. Gotcha. But I do read a lot. I'm actually working on my own book. Um, slowly but surely, because I am a writer and I'm also a journalist, but, you know, writing as a journalist or writing screenplays or one person shows is a lot different than writing a, a memoir or a, even a fiction book. So um, it's going to be a, like an autobiographical, but maybe in a different kind of format than just the traditional, you know, autobiographical memoir. It'll probably be... Um, I don't know yet, but I just, I've just started really working on it. I've been talking about it for years, but I'm just now actually doing it. And it's a long process. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, uh, Kat, I want to ask you, um, there's this film out of the many that your dad made. I mean, he made so many iconic legendary films that, um, that are still popular to this day. But there's one that was made in 1962, but released in 1963. It was Jonathan Winter's film debut. It had everybody in it. Spencer Tracy, Sid Caesar, Jonathan Winter's, Buddy Hackett, Mickey Rooney, Jim Backus. The list could just go on and on and on and on and on. Milton Berle, Jack Benny. Uh, yeah, so. Sid Caesar. Sid Caesar. <laughs> Sid Caesar. Harry actually. Thomas. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's hard to even remember everyone who was in it. Carl Reiner, who just passed Carl away. Carl Reiner, yeah. Uh, Barry Chase, I think, is the only living cast member from the film, the female who dances with Dick Shaw. Oh, yes. And um, I'm so glad that you brought up that film because every place I go, it seems that somebody comes and says, oh, that's my favorite movie or that's my dad's favorite movie or that's my daughter's favorite movie. <laughs> yeah. And it spans generations. And it, um, as you said, it came out in 1963. It was number one for a whole year at the box office. And, you know, so many famous legendary comedians from Billy Crystal to, you know, I, uh, the list, Eddie Murphy, they all say that's their favorite film that inspired yeah, them. Absolutely. Even Jeff Beck, uh, the rock guitarist, that's his favorite movie. And he sampled some um, dialogue from it in one of his uh, albums many years ago. So it has this huge um, following um, kind of, of every generation, every um, you know, person, they just really relate to the film. Cause I think because it's a family film and there is no, um, 
bathroom humor and there's no cheap jokes and it's not yeah. dirty. You know, it's it's not squeaky clean. I mean, it relates no, to, no, no. Uh, kids, but kids can enjoy it. And I think that's why it's lasted so long. But there were all these uh, comedians that didn't end up in the film, like Bob Hope, uh, Lucille Ball, um, Peter Sellers. I don't know why he wasn't in it. Uh, Red Buttons. And, you know, they always used to tease my dad um, now, for so years afterwards question. that they were upset they didn't get in it. <laughs> now, speaking, speaking of that, I was reading a story. Uh, Don Rickles wanted to be in it so yeah. badly that I think your dad went to go see Don one time and your and Don spotted your, your dad and he started just making fun of him letting him know hey why wasn't I included in this film is that true is that, that true? is true yeah. yeah they became great friends and he used to see him in Vegas all the time but um Jerry Lewis even has a little cameo yeah so you know he made it into the film so I don't know exactly why Don didn't get in there, but like I said, Lucy, Bob Hope, Red Buttons, um, Peter Sellers, I and mean, there's so many oh, comedians yeah. and, and comic geniuses that didn't make it into the film, because I guess there was just so many that um, there had to be a limit, you know, and because it was a pretty tight script. So- Because yeah. um, this looked like- you know, I don't think they just threw people in there. It was, it was pretty much structured. I have to tell, tell you, Kat, that looked like the most difficult film to make with all the twists, the plots, the stories, like trying to get everybody, I mean, their story straight. I mean, this person's doing this over there and then it cuts away to another couple. Then, I mean, so just trying to really get this film down to the details looked like, it looked like a very impossible film to make, a very difficult film to make. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't around then, but I know a lot oh, okay. of the stories. Uh, I was born after the film. In fact, my mom married my father years later, but um, she and I introduced the film a lot. Like I mentioned, um, it's had a lot of anniversaries and screenings. And there's been a few that I've just introduced it on my own, like at the Egyptian theater in Hollywood, the Arrow Theater in Santa Monica. Um, we And there's so many people that love the movie, like Mark Hamill, that's his favorite film of all time. So. Um, in 2018, there was another anniversary screening at the um, Aria Fine Arts in Beverly Hills. And he came and he was just gonna watch it. And, um, but he said, can I join? We had a panel before the movie and he goes, I just love the movie so much. I'm such a fan. I have so many memories of it. And he brought his whole family. And so can I join the panel? He said, I said, sure. So he was uh, on the panel with my mom and me. And, um, and then it was at the Cinerama Dome again. Um, November of 2018 completely sold out and it played for a couple of nights and to see a film that you know is from 1963 still selling out that many years later a huge theater yeah. like that shows its staying power really absolutely are and, you uh so let me let me uh say this first um like you said that was your dad's first comedy film that he, he ever made because he made dramas all through uh, his That was his, his uh, yeah. trademark was socially conscious, you know, social issue dramas. And on a dare, he made that film because one of the leading film critics had lunch with him and said, you know, Stanley, we all talk about you filmmakers and all of us critics get together yeah. and we all have this bet that you could never make a comedy. And, and then my dad said, oh yeah. And he set out to make the comedy to end all comedies. So that's really how it started. Um, but I, I think that, you know, you have all those comic geniuses and those creative minds in one film, not to mention mm -hmm. Ethel Merman yeah. and even Edie Adams and, and, you know, there was Dorothy Provine. There weren't that many females in it, but the ones that were, um, were very strong about, you know, their own point of view about a script, but he was able to, handle all those egos in one movie and everybody took favored nations yeah. and everybody got along Mickey Rooney and Buddy Hackett and Milton Mil you know, uh, Burl, Milton Burl. Milton Burl, yes. Yeah. He's an amazing person. I was fortunate to know him when we first moved back to LA because I was born here, but I didn't grow up here. Um, I grew up in Seattle, Washington and New York and then came back. And I got to open for Milton at the Friars Club um, when I was just launching my career here. And he was like a mentor to me. And you know, what's great is that all the comics, including Marvin Kaplan, who just passed away a few years ago too, 
they would come to every anniversary. So like my mom had a big one that she produced with Billy Crystal at the um, Samuel Goldwyn Theater for the Academy. And everyone who was alive from the film came and there was this huge panel and Billy moderated and my mom was on it and um, Jonathan Winters. And I mean, they were all there. Everyone who was alive and, and this was in 2012, they all came and they would always show up. It just, if they were, if they were sick or they had passed away, that would be their excuse for not being there. I mean, even Sid Caesar at the end, when he wasn't even talking and was wheeled in, he would show up. So I think that's one of the few films that has also that kind of um, respect and, and affection from the cast members that still show up even oh, after yeah. my father passed away. And, you know, most of the, uh, the other Spencer Tracy and the other cast members, they would always show up. Uh, that says a lot, you know, about so, their belief in it. So I could uh, go on and on and forever about this film, but uh, I want to quote something that your dad said, which is absolutely true. And that's one thing he learned is um, about comedy is that comedy is a grim business that you've never seen comedy unless you've seen comedians perspire, perspire and sweat in 130 degree weather out in the desert trying to get that perfect shot or a certain scene just right. Because uh, I think I remember Sid Caesar talking about how they would film all day and uh, how it was like one scene that they'd just be filming all day just to get to that right uh, I think scene. so, yeah. yeah. Um, boy, that must have been amazing to be part of that. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know? And all the landmarks, you know, like most of it was filmed in Palm Desert and Palm Springs, not all of it, a lot of Long Beach locations. And, you know, there, it was, it was a lot of it though, was the uh, Palm Springs area. And I'm on the, um, the board, I'm a founding board member of the Palm Springs International Comedy Festival, which is only two years old, but we established the Stanley Kramer Mad World Comedy Ensemble Feature Film Award um, in honor of the film and the fact that it was, you know, Palm Springs based in many ways. And the first year we honored Book Club because that was an ensemble female focused movie with Jane Fonda, Diane Keaton, Candace Bergen, Mary Steenburgen. Those were the, the main cast members of uh, other than like Don Johnson and Richard Dreyfuss, um, Ed Bagley Jr. Um, Craig T. Nelson. It was a very ensemble focused film and that got it the first year. And then this year, just back in October, we honored the comeback trail, which my father would have gotten a huge kick out of George Gallo's movie on He Loves Mad World and said he that Mad World inspired him to make the comeback trail, which was um, a remake of a film in the 70s, but he updated it and he said he studied Mad World like a hundred times <laughs> to figure yeah. out the shots. And, and this movie hasn't come out yet, but it stars uh, Robert De Niro, Morgan Freeman, Tommy Lee Jones, oh. Zach Braff, Emile Hirsch, uh, Eddie Griffin. So it's again, a more male oriented, but it's an ensemble uh, cast. And uh, both movies uh, owe a lot to just the, the fact that it's an ensemble focused film, but I think the comeback trailer, you can really see um, in having seen the film, even though it hasn't been released yet, you can see the influence of Mad World. Now there was a film that was made, uh, I think in the nineties called Rat Race, yeah. which was, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So your, your reaction kind of tells unauthorized. me. That was unauthorized. Yeah. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't um, sanctioned by us or by the studio. It was a movie that was kind of loosely based on, like an homage to Mad World, but it certainly okay. wasn't a remake. No, we're actually working on a sequel to it because I, I think, um, I mean, you could do a remake, but it was so iconic for its day. Yeah, a remake would have to would almost pale in comparison. But a sequel, there's a little bit more flexibility there, and you could do a sequel with today's comics, um, you know, as Descendants, or there's different ways you can do a sequel and use the technology and hey, I think right now we actually are in a mad moment. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we yeah, we've been trying years. to get we something off the ground. Years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it'll happen. I mean, it just, uh, people are afraid to tackle it because it's such a big yeah. movie with so many people in it. And um, my dad had a special 
way that he could, uh, you know, handle all those egos, as I mentioned, but that doesn't yeah. mean somebody else couldn't come along and be ambitious and try and take the story into the next. Did I hear you say that uh, uh, there's a sequel being made to it right now? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're working on that. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, anyway. Rat Race was not, uh, yeah. not at all, uh, con it wasn't a remake. It was just somebody trying to do their own version of what they think. Gotcha. Is. I have an I have to admit I've never even seen it. That's oh, not gotcha, gotcha. It. Not that it's not funny, but I just yeah. I didn't really want to see it when uh, when I can see the original real Mad. Oh, World absolutely, and, absolutely. And um, not see somebody try and do something that's a ripoff, you know. <laughs> absolutely. So, Cat, yeah. let's talk about you. I know that we've been talking about your dad, but let's talk about you. Um, so, first off, uh, you. Uh, had won multiple awards for your roles as Miss Helen Keller. Yes, yeah. What was that, would you say one of your favorite roles that you've it played? It was, yeah. yeah, and to do it on stage at a young age and play her and, you know, playing a historical figure like that in classic play also got me very interested in advocating for the deaf community and the blind community. And I try and incorporate, um, you know, ASL and, uh, interpreters and, and try and screen films open caption when I'm presenting them for my screening series. I also want that, you know, element brought into the films I'm doing. So, you know, there's always going to be a version that's captioned and audio description. And it's, it's becoming like a requirement now, especially um, with the guilds. But um, I was kind of on the ground floor of really pushing the advocacy and making sure that um that they're represented in the medium so yeah that's something that so is, i really learned from playing her so is playing helen keller a <clears throat> a hard thing to do i mean uh, since there's no words no i mean she couldn't really see or hear so is that kind of a challenging role at the same time it was a challenge but i have to be honest i it's almost like i was i knew at a young age i'd be playing her because my mom says um, I was going around the house pretending to be blind and <laughs> saying one day I'm going to play Helen Keller. And then a few years later, um, I auditioned for it on uh, in the stage and got the part. Like, they just told me I had the role. I didn't even have to wait a day. And I just sort of knew what to do. Yeah. You know? um, not every role is like that. You know, sometimes yeah. you just can't. But I think if you're meant to do something, you're meant to portray that character or have a journey with that subject and it comes easy you know like um the diary of Anne Frank I played her that was a little harder yep. but I I kind of got into that too and you know um Joan of Arc and the Lark I've played a lot of historical characters and then in the projects I'm doing now uh, all those roles just came really easy to me so I didn't really have to I mean, I researched it, but I just sort of found the characters straight away. And I think maybe that's how it's supposed to be, that if you have to, if you're struggling with something, maybe that's not the role for you. Yeah. I don't know. So, <laughs> so you nice mentioned, uh, so you mentioned your, your mom um, a couple of times here. Uh, how, how, how is Miss Kramer doing? She's doing fine. Um, she's an actress, you know, she's yeah. an award winner and acclaimed producer. And she's also working with me on um, a lot of projects. During the pandemic, we've been able to, because we have a production company, so we've been able to really work on the projects, develop the scripts more. And I've got like 10 I'm working on. Um, and I have my screening series, Cat Kramer's Films That Change the World, which is kind of under the banner of Kane K Productions, which is our production company. And then I'm going to be opening up another company um, called Fire Goat Films. It hasn't been announced yet, but um, I'm an Aries of Fire Goat. It has here Chinese now. Chinese it, it has here now. Yeah, you heard it here. Heard Fire it here Goat first. Films, and there'll yeah. be some, um, you know, different kinds of like animation and different, um, different mediums than what I've done. It's my first, I'm working on some things now that are gonna be in the animation space. Oh, yeah. And I've always loved that, but it's my first time trying to produce or be involved with animation. So it's a learning, a learning experience. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of projects I'm trying to get off the ground and they all pretty much are issue based. Um, 
some are more, you know, about the issue than others, but they all have a, a message in them. So I guess in that sense, I'm like my father. Yeah, yeah. so I, I was going to say, it sound, kind of sounds like Stanley, like something that Stanley would, would do, tackle the issues like you were talking about. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's in my DNA. It is, absolutely, it is. So uh, last year in 2019, um, you recently uh, won an award uh, for your role as Fran in uh, the indie film Turnover. Uh, which uh, is on Amazon Prime and other multiple platforms. Can you tell us a little bit about t uh, Turnover, what it's about? Yeah, that's exciting because um, I didn't have to audition for the role. The director, Linda Palmer, uh, wrote it. She co-wrote it with Larry Griffith and she directed it. And when I read the script, I said, I really want to be a part of this. And um, she said, can you tell which role I have in mind for you? And I said, Fran. And she said, yeah, and it was interesting because Fran could be perceived as a villain, um, you know, the the woman you love to hate, but I decided right away that I, you don't play that even if you're playing, quote unquote, a bad person or a selfish person or a narcissist, you have to find the humanity in the character and, you know, try to find redeeming qualities. So I committed right away and then I had some meetings with Linda and the other producers and they brought me on as a co-producer. And um, it's about diversity and inclusion. And it's a, it's a comedy, but it's also got dramatic elements. So I, I'd say it's a dramedy. It's a strong ensemble. Um, and the thing that struck me too was that there were two Down syndrome characters, one in particular, but, but two Down syndrome actors were cast in supporting roles, which is you know, again, representation being so important. They talk about, you know, casting um, people with disabilities and developing roles for them, but you don't see it that often. So I was struck by the the fact that Linda and the um, team wanted to, you know, have the, these characters represented. And then because I work a lot with the deaf community and entertainment, um, we decided to turn one of the characters, Julie, who was a hearing character originally in the script, into a deaf character. And I was able to be involved with casting the deaf actress, Raquel McPeak, who plays her. Um, and as a co-producer, I was very involved with the casting and the story. I was able to cast uh, Daniel Hoffman to play my son, Sean. And um, the movies won so many awards anyway. And then I was really lucky to win Best Supporting Actress at the Love International Film Festival. And it was, you know, a pretty competitive category. I was the only actress from the United States who was nominated because it's an international festival and they were all from other countries. And um, I was just really happy to be, uh, to get that award. It's a very meaningful award. It's a festival that, you know, has only been around a few years, but it does make a difference in the independent film world. And so, um, but the film is very um, much a family film. And we've, got, you know, just gone through the roof with reviews and, and um, accolades. And I, I really think it should be a series. We we're talking about making a series, either a web series or just like maybe on Amazon because it takes place basically in the world of the restaurant industry. And um, there's a lot you can do with that with, you know, storylines around a restaurant. There hasn't been anything like that in a while. And with the pandemic and all the restaurants closing and having a yeah. tough time, I think that it could really go um, as a series. So that's something that I'm looking forward to developing. Does that award that you won from the film festival sit somewhere in that room that I'm looking at? Um, Yes, that's it up there on the... Oh, I, I was thinking that was it, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a beautiful award. It really yeah. is great. And it's a strong cast. We have uh, Paul Gilfoyle, who's an actor, a veteran actor who's done a lot, who was in Spotlight and um, Hoffa, and he's been in many movies and television shows. Um, he's the lead in Turnover, if there is a lead, because it's an ensemble cast. Uh, Donna Mills is in, in oh. Turnover um, in a role, kind of a departure for her. Um, Beverly Todd, um, Jamie Brewer, who's on American Horror Story. She's one of the Down Syndrome actors. Carlos Carrasso, um, Riker Lynch, Adwin Brown. I mean, it's a really strong well, ensemble. This goes cast. on and on, yeah. It's yeah, so I'm very, you know, we're still um, getting it out there more because 
it's been on these other platforms. It's most people see it on Amazon, but um, you know, we had a theatrical run and then we were getting ready to do, I was actually going to be hosting a screening of it and moderating the panel when the, when the pandemic struck, so we couldn't do anything, yeah. but it just went straight to Amazon prime and that's where it launched. Now so. you're also, you're also working on a couple other projects as well. Uh, one of them is called mother's day memories. And the other one is called Fate's Shadow. Um, so between the uh, turnover and these two, it sounds like you're staying quite busy these days. Well, yeah, Mother's Day Memories is a, a dramatic short film, but it's won a, a lot of awards on the festival circuit. And it won this year, right at the time that the uh, COVID-19 crisis was just getting started. It won the Idlewild Festival of Cinema Indie Spirit Award, but it's been all over like Louisville, Kentucky, um, back East, the Chelsea Film Festival, LA Shorts, uh, very prestigious festivals. And we're actually, um, we are pushing it for awards consideration because it's about Alzheimer's disease and how it affects families. And I play the wife of, um, Bill Hoverston plays the lead. It's actually a true story and he wrote it um, based on his own experiences with his mother who had Alzheimer's. Um, yeah. It's dramatized a little bit, but it's basically a true story. Um, and Matthew Ross is the co-writer and director. And we have Keith Jeffries is a major cinematographer from the BBC. And so we were for, you know, fortunate to have him. And so we, um, we're gonna be you know, presenting it uh, for awards consideration. Um, we have Alzheimer's LA and a lot of the um, national chapters endorsing the film. I'm pretty sure it's going to be screening at a drive-in coming up. Um, Arena Cine Lounge has a drive-in that they're doing for films that are, um, you know, up for awards consideration because we can't screen them. They can't screen anywhere where anyone can see them except online. So he's uh, making a drive-in available for films that need to be seen um, to actually have a theatrical run. I don't know when that's going to be, but I'll let you know. Um, but it's only going to be in LA, I think. Probably oh, next gotcha. month, I would guess. Oh, gotcha. And Fate Shadow just played um, a film festival in London. It was accessible for the public to see. That's a short film that Michelle Arthur um, wrote and directed and stars in and it's about reincarnation and what's interesting about that film is that my mom is also in it she kind of came out of retirement as an actress because she stopped acting many years ago and she we play mother daughter I, my name is beverly in that film and um we play mother and daughter in that film has won so many awards around the world and so michelle's now making a feature out of it and we're part of that too and so it's interesting to see, uh, these are all female filmmakers pretty much um, with Turnover and with Fate Shadow. On Turnover, it was all female crew. I mean, the cinematographer, the sound, most of the, you know, the, the whole makeup team, the producers, there's a few male uh, producers, but it was basically a female's empowerment um, team on that. That was another thing that really struck me about Turnover is the um, you know, it, it's a film that was, you know, a labor of love for female filmmakers and it's all about getting them behind the camera more and more. I don't think that they get enough recognition as much as they should. I, no. I, I So I'm with you on that one because it seems like that there's, uh, not without going rationalization or generalization, but it seems like that the male actors or male just kind of get more recognition than anything. Well, in my screening series, I uh, have the 10th anniversary is called Shiro's for Change. That's the theme. And it's all women's films made by women, about women. Um, maybe there's just one movie that's co-directed by a, a husband and wife team. But for the most part, it's all, you know, women's issues, women behind the camera. And, um, you know, I'm just really excited. I'm going to have like a mini film festival with these movies sometime in 2021, probably February, March timeframe. Yeah. And um, I have the Hunt for Humanity Award named for Marsha Hunt, and that will be going to a new recipient will be announced. And I'm gonna create a Shiro Award for Shiro's for Change, and that will obviously be female. So yeah, I have a lot of um, ideas on how to keep, 
you know, pushing for that. And I started the screening series with Yentl, um, Barbara Streisand's masterpiece. You can't get more female empowerment than that. Yeah. And the story yeah. and also her being the first woman to act, star in, direct, write, produce, sing all the songs, be the, the master you know, behind the whole thing. Um, and she really broke the glass ceiling on that. So um, I've really, you know, been advocating for women behind the scenes, even before it was fashionable to do so. Because I think people forget that, you know, Mary Pickford and um, Douglas, built Douglas the film Douglas. industry yeah. built, and, and then there were so many women directors um, and, and women behind the camera in the very beginning of film. And then it kind of went into a different direction. Absolutely. But we're trying to bring it back, you know, because they did bring the industry to, you know, from France, they did bring the industry to um, the USA. And we need to remember that women had a lot to do with where we are now in film. I agree. I agree with you 100%. So Kat, uh, you were telling me how you had a, uh, a announcement that you wanted to make um, that uh, you forgot to mention yesterday on someone else's podcast that I won't mention. Yeah, but I, uh, reasons. <laughs> yeah, I will. Well, I'll mention that one again, just because I, I'm, it just launched today and I'm excited about it. And then I'll talk about the other. Um, the other announcement actually ties in with what we were talking about <laughs> a second ago. Um, but I'm, uh, you know, the, the performing idol that I look up to the most is Lily Tomlin. And she's oh, also... Yeah. Um, the ambassador for my cinema series, having been involved with most of the screenings and she even narrated one of them that I presented a documentary. And she's also part of a lot of the ones coming up I'm gonna be screening and, and debuting. And she's also in line to get one of the awards. I'll hint at that, either the Hunt for Humanity or Shiro Award. I haven't even told her yet. So you are getting this firsthand. Um, that I yes. want her to be on her because she, you know, she's been such a big supporter of this series and a champion because we advocate for the same issues. Yeah. And she's been so generous in her time, uh, giving it to me and, and hosting and being on all the panels and being on television with me and radio and just, you know, being such an activist, which is really what the focus of the series is. Activists, um, because they get the word out there about the issues, but also they're part of the films. So it's really marrying the two things together, you know, the activism and the film world. Yeah, but yeah. I did a whole musical salute to her for the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters when she was honored um, with the Art Gilmore Award at the Pioneer Luncheon a few years ago. And then they asked me to join the board because I had done that performance. I actually opened the show and I was on the dais with all these giants like George Slaughter and Sally Kellerman and Bruce Valanche and Joanne Worley. I and, love Bruce. You know, Bruce is a great guy. Well, what you're going to love, what, what I'm going to share is that there's now a new channel um, representing these luncheons. We changed our name to the Hollywood Media Professionals just to, just to bring like a new profile to the organization, to bring younger members, because it's been around for over 50 years. And it's, you know, um, celebrating icons in show business, sports, television, broadcasting, music, and um, everyone from, you know, you name it, Mickey Rooney to Larry King to Henry Winkler to Barbara Eden to Loretta Swit, uh, Johnny Mathis. Um, the, I mean, the, we've been, you know, since I got on, um, on board in the last couple of years. We've honored so many people. We've had four luncheons a year. But if you think it was started in 1966, so there's all these archival lunches that have all been filmed and no one's ever seen them. So we decided to start a channel called the HMP Celebrity Showcase. And I get to kick off the channel with my musical salute to Lily called Dear Lily Tomlin. Um, and it's going to be up for the whole week on the main segment. And then it stays up because it's a weekly YouTube show. And then Bruce Valanche is coming on Sunday, his segment where people will be able to see his speech for Lily on the 13th. And then George Slaughter and Gary Owens um, will be the following week. And then it, it closes with Lily herself 
So people will be able to see, the public will be able to see her acceptance speech because it was really only for members and people that were there. Uh, my video has actually had become popular when, when, cause it was a musical salute and they don't ever have musical performances at these luncheons, but people will be able to see it again in this new um, way with this channel. And it's for people that have never seen it, but the rest of the month they're they're seeing the speeches for the first time. And, so that's uh, and it's going to be a different honoree every month. And um, you know, I know Rich Little is the month of January, and then the late Carl Reiner is February, and then they're going to announce March through December of 2021, uh, the first of the year. So, but it's an evergreen, continuing on channel. It's it's not. It's not just for now, it's it, once it's there, it's it, it's established representing the organization. And then we'll be able to go back and have luncheons again and get new members and keep it going into the future for new generations. So that was the announcement I made. And, um, you know, the channel is being seen all over the world. Um, I think it launched at 6 a.m. this morning. And- um, Is it know, on YouTube? It's on YouTube, yeah, definitely. And, um, but we, you know, we're looking for as many people to see it as possible and Absolutely. discover the organization and also the channel. But the other announcement I'm going to make is um, back to my, besides an, uh, announcing that film company uh, title is um, through my screening series, I've decided to start a new program um, called um, New Voices for Change to go along with Shiro's for Change and, you know, the the fact that I want all the projects to focus on social issues and socially conscious themes, instead of showing movies all the time and having panels, I've decided to take um, a screenplay written by a writer, uh, up and coming writer actually named Robin Streichler, and it's an environmental madcap comedy, but it's got social issues about the environment and um, LGBTQ. I mean, there's so many issues in this script, but it, what you'd love about it is it's very female focused and it's very much like another mad, 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 mad world. I mean, it's an original project, but it has a lot of the same elements of mad world. So I'm going to have a virtual table reading of that um, to raise awareness about a lot of environmental organizations. And then we're gonna go for, you know, making a feature out of it. And um, it's really different. Most people will do like a table reading based on an existing movie, but I'm doing it backwards. I'm gonna introduce the, the script and it can even be a play, but it's, it's a new work um, and it's environmentally focused and also climate change you know, it's got all those elements and have it as a table reading first, just to introduce the um, story and the script and then make a movie. So it's kind of <laughs> very ambitious to do it backwards, but that's what I'm gonna do. And I'll have like a different project a year, uh, separate from the film, separate from the awards that introduce writers that are writing socially conscious projects. And Kat's so also one other thing too, as I mentioned. And, and one other thing, um, uh, just to go go off topic here for just one moment, uh, you are the goddaughter of Audrey, or excuse me, Catherine Hepburn, not yes. Audrey Hepburn. Yes, Catherine Hepburn, and they weren't yeah. even related. People thought they were related, but they weren't. Yeah, she's my godmother, and I am. Um, and she was in I, uh, uh, one of your dad's film called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. That's probably my favorite film of my father's because of that reason that I'm named for her and she was my godmother. And when I was born, she sent my parents a christening dress, her actual christening dress and the petticoats that went with it and a note saying, she will forever be telling them, spell it with an A. <laughs> That's a <laughs> great impression. The A in the middle because nobody... Nobody ever got her name right, and they certainly don't get mine. And so she used to write these notes to me from, actually from Auntie Kat, not from Kate, because even though Kate was her, you know, most um, popular nickname, behind the scenes, she was called as Kat with close friends and family. So Kate may have been more her public nickname, but Kat was her personal nickname. And I think that's why I go by Kat is because I know that they're going to spell that right, except sometimes they spell it C-A-T. C-A-T. 
<laughs> but yes, so um, I started, you know, like doing impressions of her and I decided to make a character named Auntie Kate, just because more people can relate to that. Um, would you ever, uh, would you ever, would you ever make a project uh, paying homage to her? Yeah, I, I have this character in my show. Oh, you, you just That's like my that. alter ego. And we have a song called, uh, we both sing together. I play both parts, Catherine with an A, which is a parody of Liza with a Z. But yes, I, I would consider, um, some kind of a project where it's just a tribute to her too. Yeah. You know Wonderful. what, how I could do that? There's, yes. I'm on the, um, I'm not on the board, but I'm the West Coast representative of the Catherine Hepburn Cultural Arts Center in oh. Connecticut, which was named after her and which really came into being after she passed away. It was kind of her legacy was donated to this cultural center and they have a very happening theater called the Kate and I would love to play my my solo show with the Kate and that would be that would be like a huge goal of mine um you know I, I will do that it just right now theaters they're closed and nothing's happening across the country but when live theater comes back I'll have my new show and I'll go to the Kate and and I'll do Catherine with an A there. <laughs> well, with any of your theater, please come to Kansas City. Uh, I'd love oh, absolutely. To, yeah, we have some great theaters here that uh, that uh, people seem to stop by and do their products with. So, uh, but Kat Kramer, thank you so much for your time, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It was so much fun to talk to you about one of my favorite films and sharing your dad and uh, just talking about Hollywood history. So this has been so much fun and thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Stay, hey, stay safe where you are. You too.